morning everyone uh, welcome to the platform of orthopedic research and education foundation india today we have our chairman dr john mukopadhyay sir who is teaching us about basics of principles of fracture fixes so over to you sir thank you janki uh, today the talk is going to be on the basic principles of fracture fixation and uh, Hopefully, by the end of this talk, most of you would be able to understand the principles of fracture fixation that will lead to early functional after treatment. Realize how the soft tissue. Uh, realize how correct reduction techniques respects the soft tissue envelope, and understand concepts of stability. the effect of on bone healing and the correct application of implants so the basic goal of any treatment of fracture is to try and restore normal function as soon as possible okay so your aim is not uh, how soon the bone heals but how soon the patient can regain function so it's not just the fracture healing that is important it is the regain of function that is important okay now we all know of what was known as fracture disease or plaster disease where you end up with chronic edema soft tissue atrophy joint stiffness patchy osteoporosis variously referred to as uh, sudex atrophy initially the rsd or reflex sympathomimetic dystrophy and today these are all classified as chronic regional pain syndromes but a lot of this is to use with issues atrophy of muscles leading to uh, chronic edema swelling pain etc so i think it is important that we try and reduce the incidence of this as uh, Graham Apley, a very well-known teacher in England, who's written a number of books as well, had said that a broken bone heals because it is broken. So any bone that is broken will try to heal, and this can be seen even in the bones of the mummies from Tutankhamen. But you need a favorable biological and mechanical environment. to get good healing and good functional rehabilitation okay, so uh, the important thing to understand in uh, fracture healing is the concept of the strain theory given by stefan perren who was one of the uh, leading figures in the ao especially as far as research was concerned okay so he uh, propose the strain theory where you had an ideal strain for a fracture to heal uh, if there was more than that amount of strain in the fracture area this fracture would not heal because whatever tissue was formed would uh, be unable to form properly because the strain was too much and for the heal tolerance of that tissue okay so you could have a fracture without any movement which would heal with uh, direct bone healing as it was known that is healing without callus or you had a kind of ideal kind of relative stability where the fracture would heal with callus formation and if the strain was more than this then the fracture would not heal at all okay and this depended on the fracture gap okay now what the strain is is a percentage of the deformation of that occurs at the fracture gap to the fracture gap okay so if the fracture gap is large then even if you have a deformation which is that much it will be in ratio to this entire gap would be delta l over l multiplied by 100 okay 
And as long as that is less than 2%, there will be what we call absolute stability, which would be healing without callus. If it was between 2 to 10%, it would be uh, relative stability and healing with callus. And if it was more than 10% or more than 20%, if it's 10%, you would get granulation, more than 10%, you'd get granulation tissue without bone formation. And if it is more than that, you will really hardly get any tissue forming, forming in that gap. Okay, so this was what Stefan Perrin had proposed many years ago and is still very true. Now, what that means that within a small gap, even a slight deformation becomes a large strain. Okay, so if you have a small gap, even if you have a strain that increases this gap from this to this, it's a large strain because relative to the gap, it will be a large percentage of the gap. Well, if you have a large gap, a movement of a few millimeters will not be a significant strain on the fracture area because you have a large gap where the strain is sort of distributed equally. So the amount of strain at a tissue level is much less than you would have in a small gap. Okay, so this is really fundamental to under your understanding of fracture healing. And this was a model video that Stefan Perrin had made himself. So you can see that this is like a multi fragmentary fracture and this is like a simple fracture and you can see with whatever strain whether you elongate or you bend the amount of deformation within this small gap is a lot more than if you see at a cellular level when it's a multi-fragmentary fracture where the fractures are sort of distributed in multiple pieces okay so this is the essence of understanding the strain theory and understanding why some fractures will heal with relative stability while others that relative stability or that amount of strain is not good for relative stability it will end up with instability okay so generally by and large and this is not an absolute rule that if you have a small gap in a fracture what you want to do is to reduce that gap to almost nothing, compress across the fracture, achieve what we call absolute stability, and hope for healing of a primary variety, what we know as to call direct bone healing or primary bone healing, where there is healing without callus. Okay? So small gap plus compression leads to absolute stability. There is no movement or a low strain environment, which will lead to direct healing without any callus. Okay, but if you have a small gap where there's no compression, you may get what you call relative stability, but this will be an area of high strain because this little movement will be a large percentage of the gap, <coughs> which will be a high strain environment, which will lead to poor healing. On the other uh, side, if you have a large gap, you bridge across this area, okay? So there may be some movement here, but whatever movement there is here, the strain will be equally distributed along this entire area. So the strain relatively will be a low strain and this relative stability will lead to healing with callus, okay? So you get a large bone gap, relative stability, you'll have movement, but it will be a low strain environment, which will then allow indirect healing with callus formation, okay? Now, when you are dealing with a fracture, you have to think about what are the important things for that fracture. So like, is the anatomy crucial? So where you have a, Articular fracture, yes, the anatomy is crucial. You want anatomical reduction of that fracture, okay? Where you will want to do open reduction to get a good, accurate reduction of the fracture fragments. 
without any gap. And then you have to decide on the implants that you use to fix it. And usually in this situation, you will go for compression where you have the anatomical reduction not so important, but importance is to the length alignment and axis where you can bridge the fracture. So there's a whole range of fractures depending on where they fit in. And like I said, these are not absolute uh, rules, but when you come to articular fracture, it will be mostly compression with anatomical reduction. When you come to more comminuted diaphyseal fractures, it will usually be mean bridging without accurate reduction of each fragment, either with a nail or a bridging plate or even with an external fixator. Okay. So where anatomy is crucial, you want precise reduction with visual uh, confirmation, which means open reduction. You need usually absolute stability techniques with implants under tension, with load, that means compression, lag screws, etc., so that you can compress across the fracture to give you absolute stability. This should end in a low strain environment where there's minimal movement and therefore healing will be by remodeling or direct healing of bone without callus formation. Now, usually for this sort of reduction, you will need open reduction, which will may sometimes need extensive exposure, but you have to try and minimize the extent of this extra exposure that you need to get accurate reduction. So just because you do open reduction does not mean you totally devitalize the tissue. You try to maintain the periosteum the muscle tissue wherever possible, but the fracture site needs to be accurately reduced and compressed. So if you have an articular fracture, like in the knee joint, you can see the CT scans, you can see the depression. You need to get all of this reduced accurately, compress across the fracture with lag screws and then buttress the fracture so that you get a good stable fixation, which allows you early motion and this will go on to heal. Now, absolute stability relies on tension implants, which means preload. Okay, it's like the spokes of the wheel, which are tight and they keep the rim of the wheel intact. Okay, and the more uh, the preloaded implants are, they will maintain forces of reduction and fixation. So, how do you achieve this? One is a lag screw. Now you can do this either with a partially threaded cancellous screw where all the threads cross the fracture line and as you tighten it, it is going to compress this against this fragment or compress this against this fragment because you've got a washer there. You can do it as a protection plate where you have a lag screw to fix your fracture and get compression and then a protection plate which was earlier known as a neutralization plate. Today the Favored term is a protection plate for these plates. Okay, so you put lag screws and a protection plate. Again, a, another situation where you can use two lag screws and a protection plate. You can compress with the plate. Okay, so there are different ways you can compress with the plate. One is the dynamic compression hole in the plate works by, as you tighten, tighten the screw, the screw goes from the eccentric part of the hole to a more centered part because of the slope of this hole. As you tighten the screw, you place the screw eccentrically, but as you tighten it, it will go more centric. And with that, it will pull the other fragment with the bone to compress across this fragment. Okay. So the idea is that the hole in the dynamic compression plate is designed so that as you tighten, if you keep the hole eccentric, will compress the bone uh, as you tighten the screws. The other way and a more effective and more powerful way is to use this uh, tension device. <laughs> Somebody needs to be muted uh, with a compression plate. Okay. And uh, so with a compression device, Okay, this is known as the Mueller's compression device. Initially, it was uh, 
a simple device without articulation. Now you have this articulated tension device, which you can use. You can use this for compression by putting screws on one side, attaching this to the end of the plate, uh, putting the screw on with this in a distracted position. And then as you tighten it, this will pull the plate this way and the screws are attached to the bone on the other side. It will pull this part of the bone against this bone. And then you put your screws here to fix it. So this will give you a lot of compression, much more than just the sliding hole of a dynamic compression screw will do. Okay, the other way you can get compression is to over contour the plate. So if the plate is, if the surface is like this and you bend the plate in an angle, sort of curve like that, as you tighten the screws, it will tend to cause the bone ends to come together. Okay, so as you tighten it, it will end, it will cause the bone ends to come together and will cause compression of the fracture. This will give you even less compression than the dynamic compression screw but it will also give you some compression and it's important when you have a straight bone and you want to compress to bend the plate otherwise you'll get opening out of the other side when you compress the bone okay so whenever you compress the bone you will tend to get a straight opening out of the opposite cortex so you need to bend the plate to prevent that opening out okay the other group of fractures is where the alignment is crucial, okay? Now here, you don't need to get anatomical reduction of all the fragments. What you need to get is the correct alignment of the bone, and that is in terms of length, rotation, and axis. So there should be minimal or no varus or valgus. There should be no procavatum or recavatum. The bone should be as close to straight as possible and the length should be restored and the rotation should be restored. So you need to get all of this right, but you're not worried about getting each individual fragment of the fracture right. And here we will go for what we call relative stability. And this is what you would usually achieve with an iron nail, a bridging plate, or even with external fixators. So if you have a fracture like this, if you try to get every fragment reduced, in place, definitely that will be the best anatomical stability that you can get. But at what cost? If you end up devitalizing the fragment, the vascularity will suffer and you will it will lead to delayed healing and possibly infection. So here you want to bridge the fracture, get the length right and not even worry about the exact position of individual fragments and you can see how the fracture has gone on to heal. Okay. Similarly, another fracture of the proximal femur, you can see how the femur fragments are shattered. And if you try to individually restore each fragment to position, you will end up devascularizing it. So if you can reduce it closed, get a nail across with good stable purchase, uh, you can get this to heal. So here, as you can see, it's been nailed with, uh, this was a gamma nail in those days, a proximal femur nail, similar to that. And you can see how this fracture is going on to heal again without any disturbance of the localized, vascu local vasculature and soft tissue, okay? Because it's been a closed procedure. Okay, now the nail designs have been improved a lot to allow you to nail more distal and more proximal fractures, both in the tibia and in the femur. So in the tibia, you had the expert tibial nail. Now you can have the suprapatellar nail. Okay, so here's a one where with the proximal fracture, and one of the problems was to get the right entry would normally with the normal nail would be here, and that would not give you adequate purchase in the fragment, and also would cause a deformity in this fracture as you try to reduce it. While if you go more proximally and use one of these uh, designs with a higher Herzog bend, it will give you the ability to reduce even these fractures and fix them adequately. Now, how do you plate these combinated fractures? So here, 
what you need to do is to hold the joint bearing segments in their correct anatomical relationship until the bone goes on to heal. So again, you need screws on the proximal fragment, screws on the distal fragment, the bone restored to its length, axis and rotation. Okay, And once you do that, in these comminuted fractures, the relative stability you achieve should be enough to uh, allow the fracture to heal. There's a stress distribution when you use this plate, which allows the a low strain environment, which will allow the fracture to heal. On the other hand, if you put holes all the way like this, there'll be a high stress concentration in the small area, which will lead to the fracture not healing. The other thing is minimal access, access surgeries. Okay, so you and in instruments which help you to do that. Okay, so you reduce the surgical insult to traumatize soft tissue. <coughs> you tend to use small incisions away from the zone of injury. This causes less pain, faster rehabilitation, but it may be technically demanding and may need some sophisticated improvement. So instruments such like the distractor are very helpful. Okay. You may need to contour the plate depending on the shape of the area that you're putting the plate. You slide the plate usually in a submuscular but extra periosteal uh, uh, sort of level. So you don't want to strip off the periosteum as you're sliding the plate, but it should be below the muscle. And the screw insertion sequence is important because you need to put one screw in the proximal fragment get it out to length, put it in the other fragment and then do the fine adjustment of the reduction and then put these two screws. And in a comminuted area, you will have these holes which will be without screws. Okay. If you put it here first, then it becomes very difficult for you to change it. Okay. So put one here and then the final screw there. Okay. So there are two ways you can do it. One is to align one fragment completely with the plate and then guide it to the other. Or you can do this. Once you've got the length, then you can correct this part and put these two screws. So you have one of these two choices on getting your access, uh, your uh, sequence of screws for these fractures. Okay, here's an example. This is an adolescent child. Uh, we do not have the lateral femoral nail for children available in India. This is too comminuted and too proximal for the head scale. So here's an option where you can do a submuscular plating. You can see how the plate has been slit. Minimal incisions here, a little bit of an incision in the trochanteric region. You pass the plate, you leave this entire fracture zone free. And because of this long bridging plate, you can see how quickly this throws up callus. So within three months, this fracture is healed. This is how it's in eight months. It's already uh, remodeling. And by the time the implant is removed at a year and a few months, you can see how this is beautifully remodeled and healed. Here's another example. This is a four-day-old injury in a young man. Okay. Here again, you have a minimally invasive approach on the anterior side. You slide the plate in a submuscular region and you, that's how you fix it. This is the post-operative x-ray. And you look at this and you'll say, oh, this is going to cause difficulty in healing, etc." But because this is a bridging implant, it relies on relative stability. And this is a multi-fragmentary fracture. You can see how with time, this is in six weeks post-op, this is in six months post-op, how this has gone on to heal beautifully. There's callus and remodeling taking place. And he's also got good function with it. So I think one has to understand the importance of not disturbing the fracture area, especially in very comminuted fractures. Okay, And you don't need to have locking implants. So even before locking implants, we would do it with, for example, in this fracture with a DCS. Okay, again, you can see there's no screw between this area and this area. 
this entire area has been uh, sort of uh, bypassed as far as screws are concerned. But you put a long plate, you put bridging fixation, and you can see how beautifully this goes on to heal with a good function, even in an elderly lady. On the other side, you see this. Okay, looks like a simple fracture. It's been treated with a plate. All the holes have been filled in. And you can see there's a small gap. Maybe, uh, okay. Now, what do you expect? Not a, unexpectedly, this goes on to break. Okay. Completely. It's Now it's fixed. With compression. Okay. Good stable fixation, bone grafting. And this then gradually goes on to heal satisfactorily with good function. Okay. So here's another case. First fix like this failed. It was refixed. Again, you can see there's a small gap in the fracture site. Okay, the gap is still there. Again, this fails. Okay, so in this case, because it had already been fixed many times before, three times before when she came to us, when he came to us, here we decided to put uh, additional stability with a second plate. So compression and a second locking plate in a orthogonal manner to give it additional stability. And you see how well this has now gone on to heal. So especially with the locking plates, this has allowed us to put a second plate without further compromising the circulation. Because what you've exposed is there, but you are not tightening the screws onto the plate so that the plate is not pressed against the bone as opposed to a conventional plate where the plate has to be pressed against the bone for the friction to give you stability. And lastly, what about mixing techniques? So you don't want to mix techniques within the same fracture area, but you have situations where you have an articular fracture at one end and a diaphyseal fracture at the other side. So here, you would use anatomical reduction, uh, compression, uh, fixation, absolute stability for the articular fracture, while use the relative stability for the diaphyseal and metaphyseal fracture. So you can see how this had been fixed with the articular surface, this has been bridged, and how this has gone on to heal satisfactorily with a good function. <coughs> so to end, the take home message is you need to understand the principles of fracture fixation where the anatomy is crucial. You need to get anatomical reduction, absolute stability, so that you have a low strain environment with implants under tension so that the fracture can heal without callus. Okay, where you are dealing with diaphyseal fractures or metaphyseal fractures, you want to get the alignment right. Okay, you can choose between a nail or a bridging plate or even an external fixator in certain situations. Okay, so you have a relative stability with moderate strain and you are healing with callus. But this works for a non-articular fracture. Now, the forearm bone is slightly different in that we often in the AO consider this as a Articular fracture, therefore, you need to get fairly good reduction. However, even in that, if there's a lot of comminution in one bone, we would often treat the small, the simple fracture with compression plating and bridge the comminuted area. So it's important to have a plan that makes sense and to execute that plan properly. So it's that is important. Okay, so whatever fracture you're dealing with. Whatever you choose in terms of anatomical reduction or uh, what we call uh, uh, functional reduction in the, this thing is to get uh, length, axis and rotation right so that function can be restored. Do that, have your plan, have a clear idea of what you're going to do. And then if you do it, these are more likely to succeed uh, rather than fail. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now and we have time for questions.
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we have few questions in the chat box. Sure. Uh, Dr. Gautam has uh, just a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, Dr. Gautam has asked what how relative and absolute mode of fixation affects time of weight bearing. So, uh, when it, it depends to some extent on whether you're using nail or plate. Okay, because there is some difference between nailing and plating as far as weight bearing is concerned. So by and large, in all these fractures, you want them to weight bear as early as possible, but more importantly, move as soon as possible. So certainly all these fractures, we would want to mobilize them as soon as the soft tissue setting has got down. In a femur, which has been nailed, you would usually start almost full weight bearing soon, okay? Depending, now there are a lot of factors which come in. It's not one factor. It depends on the amount of comminution. It depends on the working length of the nail and it depends on the size of the nail. So the thicker the nail, the more early you can start full weight bearing. If it's a thinner nail, you may have to protect it for some time. A more comminuted fracture, more junctional fracture, you may have to protect it for some time. Okay, by and large, nails you can put weight bear a little earlier than plates, but it doesn't mean that just because you put a plate, you will not mobilize them. Okay, the whole idea is that even if you're using relative stability, you want to mobilize these patients. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Amay Gursal asked, What uh, does the stress strain theory apply for intramedullary device also? So it does, but it's slightly different, okay? Especially for the lower limb, okay? Because what happens with the lower limb is in a simple fracture when you nail them and a patient walks on it, okay? You have very close to, you don't have true absolute stability, but very close to absolute stability, okay? Because when you're weight bearing on them, there is some biological compression which does take place, okay? So it's a very stable situation in a simple fracture. And while it's in a comminuted fracture, you want a bridging kind of fixation, which it serves again. So I think uh, it's it's a, always a interesting question when you talk about nailing in a lower limb and still do nailing for a simple fracture. And you then say that, for simple fractures, you want absolute stability. But this is where the difference comes in. When you're putting a nail, a good size nail in a simple fracture in the lower limb and they weight bear, it is very close to absolute stability. But this is not a 100% kind of answer that you... So that's why when I put up that chart, there was this overlying of certain areas, okay? So, uh, even you have used uh, for partial articular fracture, nailing like the distal tibia fracture, which is going yeah, into joint. You still want to put compression across the articular fracture line, okay, with screws, okay. So, that is absolute stability in the articular part. Yeah, so the articular and the relative stability is for the shaft, yeah. So, uh, Sachin has asked about if we use more screw in plate. Does it make any difference in fracture healing? Yeah, so the elasticity is important, okay? And judging that is important. So if you have like a distal femur fracture, we want to use a long plate, okay? So on the distal side, you have a short segment, okay? So you want to fill in all the screws there, while in the proximal side, you have a long segment, you want to put in just three or four screws in that long segment because putting in more screws will make the implant more rigid. Okay. And therefore delay fracture healing. So remember every fracture is a race between biology and the mechanics. Okay. Now, if you fill in all the screws, you create a high strain environment at the fracture level. Okay. Now, if you make it rigid, there's less micro motion. 
So there's always this balance that you have to try and create in these fractures where you're compressing across a fracture with no gap. It doesn't matter if you fill in all the screws, but where you're using bridging, you want to leave a little bit of elasticity in your fixation and put in just a ratio of usually one is to two screws for the number of holes that you have. Okay, so. So uh, there is one term uh, which is commonly used in your courses like elastic posture synthesis in the book also they have given. So can you? Uh, so that's exactly what I said. You need to have a certain amount of elasticity to your fixation. Okay, so that allows a certain amount of motion. But that is what you have to balance. There's a sort of thin line between relative stability and instability. Okay, so you have to try and that takes a little bit of judgment and time. But by and large, you try to get in a very comminuted segment. You try to get one close to the fracture, one away from the fracture and then one or two in between, okay? Unlike a simple fracture where you want to leave holes close to the fracture free, okay? Because in a simple fracture, if you put in all the holes that go close to the fracture, you're going to have no area without screws at the level of the fracture. And then if you have a gap, that will become a high strain environment. While in a big fracture gap, anywhere you are leaving, a area of screws without screw holes without any screws. Okay. So you will always have a sort of distribution of the strain over a larger area. Okay. So uh, there is, uh, Dr. Ramay asked, what can you please explain the theory of area gain with slides? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? Then I can go to that. Yes, sir. We have uh, after so fracture. Just remember, and at the end we'll do that. Sure, sir. So, after fracture around elbow are fixed, the usual problem is stiffness. So, can be mobilized immediately after day of 40. Yeah, okay. So, the idea is to mobilize them as soon as possible. However, Around the elbow, you have to be a bit careful of the wound. Okay, so usually most people have gone to uh, waiting a day or two just for the soft tissue swelling to subside before starting mobilization. But if there is no swelling, you can start straight away. If the wound closure is without tension, you can start and your fixation is stable, you can start straight away. So is there any order of screw fixation in a DCP? Like when we are using for a forearm plating. Uh, if you're pressing across the fracture, yeah. it used to be originally near, near, far, far. Okay. So when you're compressing, you put the nearest go, then this thing, and then go far, and then put the ones in between. But it's not a, see, like all these things are not strict rules. So sometimes the whole nearest the fracture uh, uh, may not be the best whole in terms of the fracture configuration. Okay, so you may go to the next hole, but what you want to do is to put one screw in centric and tighten that and then the other side you put a dynamic compression screw in an eccentric, you put the screw eccentric and as you tighten it will compress. Okay, now you can add a second screw for compression. Okay. But as you tighten it, you need to loosen the first screw and then tighten it. And this will compress it a little bit more. Okay, but not a huge bit more. And the maximum you can go is probably to a third one. But usually two is the maximum that we would do normally. So, uh, as uh, we learn what, like, when we are doing for distal femur fracture fixation, for the plating, the plate should be little away from the bone or uh, it should be between the muscle and periosteum. So another thing uh, in the uh, few of the uh, books, it is written like there should not be any tension over ITV. So how to make balance between these two, sir? Like when we are putting the plate 
in the femur, distal femur fracture, long plate, where it should be? So, if it's, so it depends on the bone, okay? So, remember these are anatomical plates with one design, which one expects to fit everybody, okay? That is not going to happen, okay? So, especially in the elderly where the bones tend to be a bit bored, uh, if you then tighten the screw on the distal part, on the proximal part of the plate, you will end up in valgus. Okay. okay? So, the plate will sit off a little bit. Now, if it sits off up to 2, 3, 4 millimeters, it probably doesn't matter. But if it sits off more than that, then you are probably okay to just bend it a little bit. This is, again, not something that is recommended as a standard thing, but in a very badly bored bone where you don't want to see eventually your varus valgus in the knee is important. Okay. And these patients anatomy has sort of remodeled to that position. So you want to make sure that there is no valgus of your knee when you do your knee fixation. So don't tighten it against the bone. Otherwise you'll end up with a valgus in the knee. Okay. okay. Now, so, low, so this is a can be a problem in areas such as the ankle area, okay, where you're putting a medial plate and very often if you don't use a plate to make the uh, a screw to seat the plate on the bone properly, you'll have a bit of the bones or plate sticking above uh, out of the bone and then over a period of time, you will get a late infection and sloughing of the skin. This has been seen and reported uh, by a number of authors by now. Okay, so I think there are certain areas where the soft tissue is poor. You need to try and get the plate close to the bone. Okay. So, uh, this, uh, one question about like uh, in the DNB, they used to ask for the viva, like one is working link and one is helicopter effect. So, if for these two persons, you can focus on it. So, helicopter length is... Helicopter uh, effect, sir. So, what happens is when you're putting a locking screw, as you're tightening it, the screw tightens onto the plate. Now, if the opposite side is not secured, it's going to... The whole plate is going to suddenly rotate. Okay, okay? just like this. We, the, this thing spokes of a helicopter, okay? So that is what is known as helicopter effect. Now, working length varies for different things. So for a nail, it is the uh, distance between the parts of the nail which are in contact with the board, okay? In a plate, it is the distance between the screws close to the board, okay? I mean that you put in in the gap in between, okay? Now, also the screws have their working length, okay? So in an osteoporotic bone, the work, if you put a unicortical screw, the working length becomes too small, okay? So they say you should have uh, bicortical screws. Okay? So the working length is a term which is used in different situations which don't always mean exactly the same thing. So there is uh, one question asked by Dr. Vijay Kumar. Uh, he wants to know about efficacy of titanium implants over stainless steel implant over the years in your own orthopedic practice of fracture fixation. So if you really look at it very uh, critically, there is very little hard evidence of one being better than the other. The only thing that is by and large kind of thought is that titanium may be better in presence of infection. Okay. Now, there, there is a certain uh, cellular level reason for this. In that, what they have found is that titanium affects the oxygen burst capacity of mitochondria less than steel does. 
Okay, so what happens is the cellular tissue is less affected by titanium and functions better in, with, in, with titanium than with steel. But this is a theoretical or a, a sort of a reasoning. There is no hard evidence to show that it really makes a difference. So we tend to use what is available. Okay, so when LCP came to India, it was it came only in titanium. Okay, while in the US they were using steel, Europe they were using titanium. Okay, so um, the one advantage of steel over titanium is there is less risk of what is known as uh, cross welding or whatever you call it, where removal of the implants is a little easier than with the titanium implants, especially the 3.5 millimeter implants. Uh, removing these locking screws is often a major part of your procedure. It can be quite difficult. Uh, very often, if all the screws are heads up, back are difficult and uh, become need to be drilled out to get the plate out. Okay, but uh, with the quality of steel and titanium that we have available today, uh, there is no hard uh, and there's no real difference between the two if, as far as the biomechanical properties are concerned. Uh, some people say that for nails, titanium is a little better. For plates, steel is a little better. But I think there will be people who are going in both directions. Okay. So one more argument about the MRI scan for steel. Yeah, so the... that is that is that uh, was definitely an issue. Now today with the modern generation MRIs, you can even do MRIs with steel implants. Steel is not magnetic, okay? So it's not a problem because of magnetic effect. The problem is because of scatter, okay? So if he has a steel implant, it's not that he can't do an MRI for the rest of the body. But in that region, there will be a problem because of scatter, which is less than that, less in titanium. Okay, so there's no reason for not doing an MRI because he has a steel implant. But if he has a, a steel implant in the region where you want to have the MRI, then it will cause disturbance in the images. Okay, so it's none of these are iron implants. Okay, which will react to the magnet. Okay, all of them are non-magnetic. Okay, so what strain means is the relative deformity occurring within the fracture gap. Okay, as and that relative means the if the diff, amount of deformity taking place with whatever force, either bending or uh, stretching or whatever relative to the fracture gap so if the so whatever is the displacement divided by the initial gap fit okay this multiplied by 100 is a percentage in which the strain is represented okay so strain is always a percentage it's not a absolute uh, this thing figure okay so depending on the gap 
the deformity that takes place between the gap, you divide the deformity by the gap and multiply it by 100. That is the strain that you get in the region of the fracture or in the region between the screws of the, fracture of the plate. Okay? okay so now, what that means is the gap, if the gap is small, even a small deformity becomes a large percentage of that gap. Okay? So if the gap is only one millimeter and the displacement is one millimeter, it becomes one by one upon one into 100. So it becomes a 100% strain. Okay? While if the gap is 10 millimeters and the deforming forces cause a deformity of one millimeter, that same strain is only 1 by 10 into 100, which is 10%. Okay? Is this clear? Yes, sir. I'll just... Uh... So, if you represent this in a figure like this, where you have a large gap, a deformity of that much, the strain will be delta L upon L, which is the original gap into 100, is the amount of strain. Now, if this strain is less than 2%, it is termed as absolute. And these figures are not 100% accurate, but is what they have worked out in the lab, is that you are likely to get absolute healing without callous for absolute stability and direct healing without callus formation. If it is between 2 and 10%, and some people may go as far as 20%, you get relative stability where you get indirect bone healing, that is healing with callus. And if there is more than that, then you just get either granulation tissue, which then with the amount of movement just ruptures, and you don't get bone formation. Okay, so you have to decide in a particular fracture whether you want relative stability or absolute stability. And if you decide on relative stability, you have to make sure that it is not too unstable to become in, unstable rather than re relative sta relatively stable, or it doesn't become too rigid to become absolute stability rather than relative stability. Okay, so this video shows it very well because if you see the multi-fragmentary fracture on the left and a simple fracture on the right, whatever motion you are doing or whatever movement you are doing, you can see how here compared to the gap, this is a huge amount of strain. Okay, while here you see how if you look at all these areas of the fracture, the amount of movement that is taking place between the cells in that area is low. Although overall the movement or the displacement may be the same, relative to each cell, the displacement is low. Okay, so you get a situation where the tissues can still heal together, uh, form bone with what we call indirect bone healing with first forming cartilage and then going on to uh, ossification of that cartilage and forming bone, calcification of that uh, matrix, which then goes on to form bone. Okay? So, so we got that reply that it is clear and thank okay. you very much. Great. So I think we need to stop sharing again. Okay, I think it's getting close to 8 o'clock. Yes, sir. So we should call it a day. Thank you so much, sir. It was, yeah. Very. Hope things are clear in terms of, there's a lot of confusion about these things and this is important to be clear about. Yes, okay? sir. Right. Thank okay. you so much, sir.